This podcast is rated E for everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Nifty Ninty. I, as always, am your host, Matt Tuna Turner, and this is the podcast where we run down everything Nintendo every single week. For those of you keeping score, this is episode number 20. I've got another really great show for you. There's been some really big and uh, interesting news over the last week. I've got another game review, but why don't we get things started as usual with this week's new releases. As is usual on the weekly release calendar of the Nintendo Switch eShop, we get a lot of indie titles. This week, we got 21 in total. That's quite a bit, so why don't we run down that list. Coming up first, Bash the Bear. wonder what happened to that bear to make him so angry. Bedtime Blues, followed by Build a Bridge. I guess what you're doing in that game is building a bridge. Followed up by Crazy Strike EX, Dying Reborn. Here's one that has quite a bit of alliteration. Fairy Fencer F, Advent Dark Force. This sounds like a RPG-type fencing game. Feudal Ally. Another game called Fight of Gods. Followed up by Forever Forest. If I had to take a stab at Forever Forest, my guess would be a walking simulator in a forest. Hopefully the graphics are beautiful because that could be quite a nice little romp through a forest. Followed up by Gunwin Clive HD Collection. Up next, Holy Potatoes! We're in space! Actually sounds like a fun game, got a bit of a cartoony aesthetic. After that, left, right, the mansion. Up next, Mars or Die, followed by Mega Mall Story. After that, Octahedron Transfixed Edition. Up next, Old School Racer 2, followed by this week's uh, probably premier indie title, Onimusha Warlords. After that, Planet Ricks 13. It's too bad that this wasn't set in the Rick and Morty universe, because that would be awesome. Followed by The Office Quest, which if it has anything to do with Office Space, would probably be a very, very hilarious game. And finally, on the Nindy front, Yik, a postmodern RPG. I wonder if I'm saying that right. Y-I-I-K. Yik. A postmodern RPG. I love a good RPG, and I'd be curious to see what this one is all about. Definitely a video to check out on the eShop. This week we saw one package title come out, and that is the Switch exclusive Travis Strikes Again No More Heroes. So once again, quite a few titles released this past week on the Nintendo Switch, especially on the digital front. There is definitely something in there for everybody. If you'd like me to do a little bit more of an in-depth look at a few of these uh, Nindy titles, please do let me know. I uh, would love to hear some feedback from you guys. Uh, perhaps if there's something you want me to try out exclusively, I can I can do that. I'll hop on the eShop and, and give it a look. And uh, I can report back for you guys. So just. So let me know in the comments below, and if you're on iTunes, uh, head over to YouTube and uh, give, it a, give it a look. Let's move on to all the things that were making headlines this past week. Up first, in something that has had a beautiful marriage for many, many, many years across many console generations. Also a marriage of, again, two of my favorite things. This time, though, not football. The WWE. Yes, the WWE is no stranger to the video game world. It has enjoyed some moderate successes over the years. However, this time we're not talking about a new video game. We're not talking about the next iteration of WWE sorry, 2K. Instead, two wrestlers have decided to take it upon themselves and do a little cosplay. WWE stars Zelina Vega and Andretta Cien Almas have joined up to cosplay as Team Rocket from Pokemon. 
not to say this is pretty awesome. However, I think it's time for WWE's resident gamers, that would be Xavier Woods and Prince Pretty himself, to step up their game and perhaps try a little cosplay themselves. Up next, everybody's favorite race car soccer game, Rocket League, has become the first game to become truly cross-platform playable. In a PlayStation crossplay beta program, we can now play Rocket League on our PS4, Switch, Xbox One, and Steam. Now, if the only thing they could do next was make Fortnite or Overwatch or PUBG a truly cross platform game, perhaps there'd be a little bit more harmony within the gaming community. Sadly, to follow up that good news, a little bit of bad news. In a recent update to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the developers have decided to remove the taunt option from Smash Ultimate's online play. Now, I'm not entirely sure why they decided to remove the taunt feature. Maybe it has something to do with, like, kids' feelings getting hurt or something. I don't know why their feelings would be hurt over a digital avatar cracking their knuckles because... You know, you got flung off the screen, but I guess that's the world we live in these days. However, because there are no more taunts, players have decided to take action in their own hands. They have started to quote-unquote teabag after taking somebody's stock. Now, I don't know if that's possible in a game where the object is to fling the opponent off the screen. Uh, generally, if you're going to quote-unquote teabag somebody, you need to be standing over them, which is a, a near impossibility inside the Smash universe. So really, they're just crouching up and down really quickly, which kind of just looks weird. So um, maybe, you know, the developers will decide to bring back the taunt feature, because really, it, it's not hurting anyone. Speaking of games, where you beat the snot out of your opponent, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. The follow-up to 2009's Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, The Black Order, has recently released its roster of playable characters. I don't know if this is the full roster, but uh, so far this is what we know. These are the characters that will be appearing in some way, shape, or form inside Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, which, if you've seen the trailer, borrows a little bit from the MCU, but not too much. Hopefully not a lot, because it we still like it to be a story that holds its own. Anyways, running down the list, we have Nebula, as we know, from the Guardians of the Galaxy series, followed by Supergiant, who is a member of the Black Order, followed up by Iron Man. Next, of course, Captain America. You can't have a Marvel Ultimate Alliance game without him. Also, Ultron will be making an appearance in this game. Of course, the Hulk. Thor, Sandman, which is one of Spider-Man's arch nemesis. <laughs> Speaking of which, Spider-Man will also be making an appearance in the game, as well as some Sentinels from X-Men. Wolverine, of course, Ronin from the Guardians and soon to be Captain Marvel franchises. Also Kingpin from Spider-Man, as well as Green Goblin. Nick Fury, whose story arc arches over many, 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 many of Marvel's Stories will be making an appearance, same with Black Widow and Scarlet Witch, Lockjaw, Falcon from Captain America's universe, someone named Crystal, Thanos, who we've seen in the, in the trailer, will also be making an appearance. So, hopefully, this is a story that stands on its own, yet still is familiar for fans to get into. Considering it is a Nintendo Switch exclusive, I still think this is a huge win and a must play on the Nintendo Switch because it's going to be fun to play this on the go. Coming up next, speaking of games that are starting to make a little bit of a comeback, there was some people who decided to hack the Nintendo Switch and dig into the Nintendo Switch online catalog of games and what he found, or maybe it was a she, I don't honestly know. There's a hacker by the name of Cappuccino Heck. Could be male, could be female, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, this person found a list of 22 Super Nintendo games that have apparently been buried inside the Nintendo Switch 
Online service. Now, if you remember when Switch Online was first announced, we would be getting a free NES and Super Nintendo game every month. Obviously, that's changed, and now we're getting a you know a free-to-play kind of smorgasbord of NES titles releasing more each and every month. But the SNES titles kind of fell off the radar. Maybe, perhaps, they're coming back. Maybe there will be an announcement at E3 about a Super Nintendo type virtual console subscription based rental service coming to Nintendo Switch and if so hopefully it's at this same subscription level and you don't need to pay any more money. I have a list of those games and I'm gonna run right through them right now. There are, as I said, 22 of them. Up first is Breath of Fire 2 followed by Contra 3 The Alien Wars and then Demon's Crest, F-Zero, Kirby's Dream Course, Kirby's Dream Land 3, Kirby Superstar, The Legend of the Mystical Ninja, The Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, Pilot Wings, Pop and Twin Bee, Star Fox, the recently released Star Fox 2, Stunt Race FX, Super Ghouls and Ghosts, Super Mario All Stars, Super Mario Kart, Super Mario World, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, Super Metroid, Super Punch Out, and Super Soccer. Now these are all games that uh, were packed into the Super Famicom or SNES Classic editions for the most part. I think uh, there might be an exception like Pop and Twin B. I'm not sure if that was in either of those collections, but uh, or Stunt Race FX. But for the most part, these are titles that were already released in some way, shape, or form uh, in those little tiny retro consoles. So if you happen to have one of those, I mean, you already have access to these games, so it's not uh, anything super special, but it's still cool and possibly telling that there is a SNES or Super Famicom, depending on your region, uh, virtual subscription console thing coming perhaps this year or maybe in a Switch 2.0 iteration. In this week's most interesting and telling bit of news, Nintendo President Shintaro Furukawa had spoke to Kyoto Shinbun about uh, a couple of things. The first is Nintendo's goal to get 20 million units of Switches sold, as well as connectivity with Pokemon Go. He also touched on Nintendo Labo and Nintendo's stance on the future of the 3DS handheld. Furukawa-san does admit that reaching 20 million consoles sold is quite a lofty number, although I believe it is kind of well over halfway there. He has said that as it enters, as the Nintendo Switch sorry, enters the third year of its life cycle, that would be this March, uh, it would be most important to focus on software, especially good software, and also the different ways to play the Nintendo Switch. As it is a hybrid, you can take it on the go or play it at home. There's also the option to play two players on a single Switch with two Joy-Con, you know, all that sort of stuff that we're all very familiar with, but I have a feeling we're going to see a little bit more of a push in terms of marketing in that uh, direction this year, especially uh, after E3 and probably into the holiday season. He also mentioned when it comes to Pokemon Go connectivity that with Let's Go, they aren't sure where they're going to go with uh, the smartphone connectivity as they're kind of using smartphone as a platform to introduce people to Nintendo franchises and characters. Speaking of smartphones, Furukara did note that the smartphone is a great platform and a great way to get Nintendo IP into the Chinese market, which has been traditionally difficult for anything that isn't really Chinese. So especially since they just kind of make their own versions of consoles and release them there, so uh, it would be nice to get some actually licensed Nintendo products inside of China. On the topic of Labo, Furukawa did note that, or I guess it I should say, admit that Labo did not sell as well as expected. However, is not surprised as it is a kind of new way to play and experience games. And uh, it did have a little uptick in the holiday season. I guess there are some people who found Labo underneath their Christmas trees. But uh, for the most part, not sell as expected. However, he does plan to expand product knowledge and perhaps uh, marketing through the course of this year. 
And finally, for the 3DS, which is entering its eighth year, I might add, so it is uh, starting to get a little old, although it has seen quite a few uh, hardware iterations. Uh, Furukawa says that they intend to continue making 3DS systems and software into the future, even though uh, they don't get a lot of love these days, which is kind of sad. I love my 3DS. It's light, it's portable, it's easy to bring with me, certainly more so than my Switch, although for the most part I do kind of bring both with me. It would be nice to see a little bit of connectivity between the two, but uh, I understand that that might not be possible. All right, well, that's it for the news. It's time to move on to a little bit of general discussion. Um, if there's any news story that I perhaps missed, let me know in the comments below, and I'll touch on it in next week's episode. But uh, for now, let's move on to what's probably going to make up the bulk of this week's show. Uh, sadly, it's not the best news, and I'm going to do my best to keep it kind of PG. It might be difficult given the subject matter, but I'm, I'm going to do my best. So last week, or perhaps it was the week before, I'm not entirely sure, there was the Anime Los Angeles Convention held at the Ontario Convention Center, just outside of... LA, north of Anaheim there, and uh, some apparent stalker decided to set the car of one of the cosplayers on fire. Now, not only is arson in itself illegal, but this is also kind of a disturbing move by someone to do. Uh, apparently, according to the victim, uh, this person is known to her and has been stalking her and harassing her repeatedly online and uh, possibly even in person. I didn't hit the article that I read did not say if it ever happened in person, but I might be able to assume that it could have happened, especially if he's willing to burn her car to pieces. Um, I mean, seriously, you gotta, you gotta treat people with the same kind of respect that you want to be treated with. These, peop these people are exactly that. They're people. They, they aren't objects for your desire. They dress up in costumes because they enjoy it, because it makes them happy, and it brings joy to the fans of these conventions. These anime obviously, obviously have an impact on these people's lives, and they want to celebrate that, and they are not an object of desire for anybody, and they are not uh, an object period you don't you don't have the you know they aren't possessions you can't own them like I, I can't believe that this this needs to be said apparently uh, there's also uh, a little bit of a, a, a me too movement going through the the uh, cosplay community, the convention community, which, I mean, I, I can't blame. If this is happening to one person, there's, there's probably quite a few more that it's happening to, and there really isn't an outlet for these people, whether it be male or female, to, to, to really come out with what's happening to them. And uh, it, it's sad. I, I, just, I just can't believe that you know, there are people out there that think this is okay to do. Uh, you know, I, I get mental health issues could play a, a factor, but, like, you, you just can't go harassing people like that. Even the simplest, like, the simplest things, like, it's just... It's mind-boggling. I, I, I'm speechless. But, I mean, even if these cosplayers do do, you know, what are called lewds uh, in the in the community, it, it doesn't give anybody domain over these people. These people do these things because they want to, or you know, simply because they just want to make a little extra cash. I mean, like, this is this. this it, it's just, it's so sad. And we live in an age where people can just yell at people anonymously, or sorry, anonymously on the internet. And, like, you need to take a step back and, like, look at 
look at yourself. Like, like, why, why would you even do that? Why, why are you wasting your time to harass these people? Don't, don't you have anything better to do with your lives, with your time? You know, jobs. Are you really that bored? And like, just because these people act or you know do their profession in the public domain doesn't give you the right to harass any of them. It doesn't matter if they're what their sexual orientation is or their gender or anything like that. It just it, it nothing gives anybody the right to treat someone that way. It's okay, you know, to be crazy obsessed about some sort of franchise like I love Star Wars, I love Zelda, I love I love, you know, all these things that a lot of you enjoy as well, but that doesn't give anybody the right who happens to be cosplaying as Slave Leia or Zelda or Link or a Final Fantasy character or anybody like that doesn't they don't have they don't deserve to be harassed. It's just they do it because they they love that franchise, that that title, that world, that universe it, and they aren't, they do it mostly for themselves and and you know we're lucky we get to enjoy that aspect of it that they get to do it but uh, this is just this is just so so bad uh, I really hope that this is something that gets snuffed out I hope um, that when this does happen the authorities are involved and people are held accountable for these actions it, it's 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 kind of sad that in this day and age that this happens, but it happens, and it doesn't necessarily happen only in the cosplay community, but it happens all over the nation, uh, the nation being America, and in, in some instances kind of around the world. It's just, there's, we, we've lost our humanity in these regards, and it, it's, it's sad, you know, these people are, are exactly that, people, we don't, we don't have domain over them. They they don't, quote unquote, deserve anything that's coming to them. They are people. We all make mistakes. We're fallible, yes. But you know, you can still treat others with dignity and respect. It doesn't matter what they're wearing, their gender, their sexual orientation. None of that. None of that should matter at all. And I just, I hope that whoever happens to be listening or, or anything, you know, like that. I hope that this kind of behavior comes to an end. Uh, otherwise, you know, people are not going to do it anymore. We're going to see less cosplayers. We're going to see less people at conventions. Conventions will probably entirely go away uh, unless, you know, our behaviors change. And I don't want to see that. I love these conventions. You know, meeting new people, like-minded people. I think it's amazing. But this kind of behavior just, it has to stop. It, it has to stop. Don't be stupid, people. Please, don't be dumb. Treat others with the same respect you want to be treated with. All right, well, why don't we move on to this week's game review. This week is a game that is an oldie, but a goodie. It's a retro title, a game that came out uh, originally on a competing platform uh, well over a decade ago, and one that I originally did play on that platform but never got to finish. I also uh, played one of its many re-releases, and uh, finally, on the Nintendo Switch, I was able to pick it up again, and this time actually complete it. And that game, of course, that I'm talking about is Okami. And as I mentioned, this is the Nintendo Switch release of Okami. Okami, originally released on the PS2 in 2006, has since been released on most home consoles, and has finally come to the Switch. After a near-perfect port on the Wii, and HD remakes on PlayStation and Xbox, is the Switch version really worth picking up the Astral Joy-Con for? Okami is an action-adventure RPG, heavily inspired by The Legend of Zelda and steeped in traditional Japanese lore. Like Zelda, you don't earn XP, instead you'll be grinding for items and money with the hope it makes the endgame a little bit easier. Also like Zelda, you play as a silent protagonist, in this case, Amaterasu with an annoying little gnat that helps you communicate and interact with the world around you. In Okami, you'll traverse the land of Nihon, a traditional writing for Japan, 
exploring dungeons, visiting villages and shrines, and defeating imps and bosses of various strengths and difficulties, all while unlocking celestial brush techniques. It's these brush techniques, along with a stunning art style, that help to set Okami apart from his competitors. Using the celestial brush doesn't feel out of place and is quite easy to do. With a simple button hold, and either some arm movement or a simple stick movement, you'll be drawing in no time. Depending on what you draw, you will either conjure up a bomb, slash an enemy, or regenerate dead foliage, just to name a few. All of these are necessary to complete certain goals, reach high platforms, and of course defeat bosses. The game does suffer from some bloat, mostly in the form of fetch quests, escort missions, and long, drawn-out text-based conversations, but the dungeons, battles, and unique cast of characters more than make up for it. The controls for Okami are pretty intuitive and easy to learn. The Switch allows for multiple control methods, including playing with detached Joy-Con to more accurately simulate the painting mechanic. I prefer to play with my Pro Controller. Not only is it ergonomic, but I don't really care for waggle controls, and the game was originally designed with dual analog sticks in mind, so I prefer to play it the way it was designed. Regardless of your preference, there are options for you. Controlling Amaterasu was easy to do, as was moving around the camera so you get a better idea of the world around you. One thing I did find difficult was the platforming. While it was nice to have a protagonist that could jump, the jumping did feel floaty and the platforming elements lacked the preciseness of some of the game's counterparts. For a game that is well over a decade old, it still looks beautiful. The traditional hand-drawn Japanese art style looks beautiful on the updated hardware. There is some frame blending, but that is far outweighed by just how magnificent the game looks overall. You can tell from the first few frames of the opening cinematic that this game is certainly something special. The game oozes Japanese lore, not only visually, but also in its menu aesthetic and the music you hear traversing the large map. The menus are large and easy to navigate, with lots of options, but not to the point where it's overwhelming. The music, which I can only assume was composed for this title, fits the aesthetic perfectly. It sets the tone in battles and provides a nice backdrop to the stunning visuals. Even the mumbled voice acting of NPCs fit each and every one of them perfectly. Just a perfect soundscape for an already stunning game. The familiar gameplay elements reduce the barrier of entry for a title that is sometimes overlooked as kid-friendly, but don't let the art style fool you. The story isn't always child-friendly. Okami is set in ancient Japan, 100 years after a terrible, multi-headed serpent monster was defeated by a brave warrior and his white wolf companion. It's near the 100th anniversary of this great battle that we pick up this tale. The descendant of that great warrior never believed in the tales and decided to remove the barrier that was said to hold the demon in place. In doing so, he had cursed the land and released the beast and doomed the people to relive the horrors of a century past. With the land slowly dying, a goddess was awoken, Amaterasu, to help undo the damage that was being done. It's on this premise that Amaterasu and her annoying little companion Isun set out on their journey. This isn't a terribly new or original story, but it's in the way it's told that sets it apart. There is a definite focus on nature and trying to restore it to its former beauty. The colorful cast of NPCs really help to flesh out the universe you're playing in. They are fun, crass, mean, and at times quite adult. This is a game that I didn't think would be as mature as it is. There is no vulgar language, but it can get quite dark and emotional, plus there is no shortage of innuendo or butts. Most of it is told comically, and would be over the head of a younger audience. As this is a retro title, you have to ask, does it still hold up today? This game still holds up, and the transition from SD to HD works quite well. The art style really helps visually, but the text boxes and storytelling methods feels a little dated. But this was a PS2 era title, so they were working with limited hardware. So the final verdict for Okami. For the gameplay, very Zelda-esque, typical RPG traps, but the brush mechanic is well implemented. I gave it a 9. For the controls, they're intuitive and easy to learn. The Switch allows for multiple playstyles. Motion controls are there if you want them, but the platforming wasn't super precise. I gave it an 8.5. The presentation, absolutely beautiful. The menus look great and are easy to navigate. The music is beautiful and fits the aesthetic perfectly. I gave this a perfect 10. For the story, emotional, funny, heartwarming, surprisingly adult. I gave it an 8.5. And, as it is a retro title, does it still hold up today? For the most part, yes, but there is some dated storytelling methods. I gave it an 8. That means the total for Okami on the Nintendo Switch is a 8.8. .8.
All right, well, that's it for another episode of Nifty Ninty. I hope you enjoyed that, and I'm sorry for getting a little heavy there towards the end, but uh, I kind of feel it had to be said. Uh, I think um, people need to respect each other, and uh, I think above all else, that's what's most important. But anyways, if you like what you see or hear, please do hit that subscribe button and turn on that little bell for notifications. If you're over on iTunes, that's awesome. Thank you for your download. Uh, I am on iTunes, as I just mentioned. You can also find me on some of your other favorite podcast sources. If you're on YouTube, thank you. And uh, you can also find me on Twitter and Patreon. Uh, Twitter is at tuna ent underscore official. That's the number two. N-A-E-N-T underscore official. Also at www.patreon.com slash tuna entertainment and www.tunaentertainment.com. And until next week, stay safe and stay nifty. Hello? Is this thing on?